February 1966, and the beautiful islands of the Caribbean wait to welcome Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, arriving for a five-week voyage in the Royal Yacht Britannia. The royal tour began in Guyana, the beautiful land of many waters, soon to become an independent country of the Commonwealth, a land of sugar, rice, and rich mineral resources, including valuable bauxite. In Georgetown, the capital, preparations were complete for the first visit ever paid to Guyana by a reigning monarch. The governor, Sir Richard Late and Lady Late, and the prime minister, Mr. Forbes Burnham, waited to welcome the queen and Prince Philip. As the royal visitors drove through the streets of Georgetown to the public buildings, the people of Guyana added their own rousing greetings. After receiving an official welcome, the Queen and Prince Philip unveiled portraits of themselves in the chamber of the legislature. Once again, they drove through the streets of the capital, where the celebrations for the royal visit were in full swing. At a civic reception in the promenade gardens, the Queen and Prince Philip met mayors and councillors of the principal towns of Guyana and their wives. Ten thousand children cheered the royal capital at Georgetown Cricket Ground and some of them gave a delightful display of folk dancing. During their crowded two-day visit, the Queen and Prince Philip were received everywhere with enthusiasm and gaiety. At Plaisance, accompanied by Mr. Forbes Burnham and Sir Richard and Lady Late, they were given a welcome characteristic of the friendly, hospitable people of Guyana. It was typical of a memorable visit, which made a happy and splendid start to the Queen's journey through the Caribbean. to Trinidad and its capital, Port of Spain. On the quay side, the Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams, and his daughter, Miss Erica Williams, waited to welcome the royal guests with the Governor General, Sir Solomon Ho Choi, and Lady Ho Choi. Troops of the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment formed a guard of honor. The University of the West Indies at St. Augustine has faculties of agriculture, engineering, arts and science, and social science. The Queen talked with some of the students who come from all over the Caribbean, and members of the faculties were presented, including Sir Frank Worrell, Dean of Studies and famous cricketer. The outstanding state occasion of the visit took place at the Red House when the Queen came to open Parliament. 
She was received by the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives. This was the first time that a reigning monarch had been present to take part in this historic ceremony. The Queen takes no active part in politics, but as head of state, she reads a declaration of the policies of the elected government of Trinidad and Tobago prepared by that government. This declaration has come to be known as the speech from the throne. After thanking the people of Trinidad and Tobago for their warm and enthusiastic welcome, the Queen went on to outline the program for the next session of Parliament. The speech referred to the development of industry at home, the expansion of public services and education, and to cooperation with sister Commonwealth countries of Canada and Jamaica, and continued support for the United Nations. Carnival time was still a few weeks away, but the people of Trinidad were determined that the Queen should see at least some of the brilliance and gaiety of this famous celebration. Some of the performers represent historical characters, and King Henry VIII caught the Queen's eye as he swept past in Tudor magnificence. Afterwards, the Queen said, if this is just a preview sample, the real thing must be fabulous. Nineteen miles northeast of Trinidad lies the beautiful island of Tobago, believed by some to be Robinson Crusoe's island. The governor and the prime minister were there to greet the Queen and Prince Philip. The royal party had lunch at Crown Point, one of Tobago's many beauty spots. The unspoilt scenery and many splendid bathing beaches are increasing Tobago's popularity as a tourist resort. The Queen saw a number of these when she drove round the island, including the magnificent view from Fort George. Grenada, the Isle of Spices, turned out to give a royal welcome to the royal guests as they drove by on their way to the colony hospital. In the grounds, the Queen and Prince Philip talk with nurses and other staff before going inside to visit some of the wards. On a drive round the island, they stopped to talk to fishermen, and Prince Philip inspected some of the catch. highlight of this memorable day was a pageant at Queen's Park. The agriculture of the island was featured by girls dressed to represent cocoa, nutmegs, bananas and cotton, Grenada's main crops. At Kingstown St. Vincent, the Britannia came to anchor at the new Deepwater Wharf. It was Sunday morning and the Queen drove through gaily decorated streets to St. George's Cathedral, where she was received by the Bishop of the Windward Islands. of the clergy were presented before the royal party went into the cathedral to attend divine service. After a quiet afternoon spent in enjoying the peace of this lovely island, the Queen came to a reception for blind people. This was held in the Botanic Gardens outside Government House. Barbados stands on one of the world's great trade routes, 
and the deep water harbour where the island's main crop, sugar, is loaded in bulk, has brought Bridgetown into line with the most modern ports in the world. At the College of Arts and Science, established at this temporary site in 1963, the Queen and Prince Philip talk to staff and students about their future plans. Young men and women from the Eastern Caribbean territories come to study at this branch of the University of the West Indies. The Queen drove on to Trafalgar Square, where a guard of honour of 100 men of the Barbados Regiment was awaiting her inspection. The Queen Elizabeth Hospital cost £9 million to build and is one of the finest hospitals in the West Indies. The operating theatre has the most modern equipment and there are special recovery rooms for surgical cases. The Queen visited a medical ward and went on to the children's ward. For Prince Philip, it was a return visit, for he'd opened the hospital when he came to Barbados in 1964. On the second day of her visit, the Queen drove through the northern district and at Farley Hill she opened Barbados' first national park. At the East Coast Road, a large crowd had gathered to see the Queen perform the official opening of this fine new highway. Britannia dropped anchor in Soufria Bay, St. Lucia, gaily decorated fishing boats came out to meet her. It was exactly 53 years to the day since the Queen's father, King George VI, then a young naval officer, had landed at Soufria. The Queen was welcomed by Mr. Bryan, the administrator, and was then presented with a bouquet by a young islander in traditional dress. In this agricultural island, bananas are the biggest export. The Queen saw bananas being prepared for shipment at Windban Research Center, which was established to encourage and institute measures for the well-being of the banana growers of the Windward Islands. Later, there was a demonstration of crop spraying. Victoria Park, there was a spectacular historical pageant. Traders in sailing ships, British repelling a French attack in the 18th century, a float showing the agriculture of St. Lucia, and dancing to represent Emancipation Day. Dominica, one of the most rugged and beautiful of the Caribbean islands. When the Queen came to Portsmouth, children danced for her before she drove through the town. The Princess Margaret Hospital in Roseau is named after the Queen's sister and was opened in 1956. Amid the gaiety and happiness of a royal tour, the sick are not forgotten and visits to a number of hospitals were included in the Queen's program. The Queen and Prince Philip talked with the staff and visited a number of wards. The Commonwealth Arts Group danced the traditional Bel Air at a rally in the Botanic Gardens. Carib baskets are a speciality of Dominica, which every visitor likes to take home. The Queen thanked the people of Dominica for their gift in these words. We are delighted with the carib baskets you have given us, which will remind us of the race which once gave its name to the Caribbean and whose last stronghold was in Dominica. With these presents, we shall take with us and will cherish warm and happy memories of the loyal people of Dominica.
whose affection and welcome we have received today. Montserrat, from the top of St George's Hill, offers a fine view of the wide, fertile plain below, with its fields of fruit and vegetables. Here it was appropriate that the main event of the day should be an agricultural show, where the Queen was presented with baskets of fruit. As she walked through the showground, many must have recalled the words of the Chief Minister's welcoming speech when he said, One of the many laudable features of the new relationship between our Sovereign and the peoples of the Commonwealth is that whereas in the past the Sovereign lived and moved almost entirely within the confines of her palaces, today she moves freely among her people everywhere and lives within their affection. Antigua, an island of magnificent natural harbours and beautiful coral reefs, gave the Queen and Prince Philip an enthusiastic welcome when they drove through the streets of St John's, bright with flags and decorations in honour of the royal visit. At Holberton Hospital, small patients had their own ideas of a suitable royal welcome. This fine, modern hospital has a recently completed block, housing a medical ward, administrative offices, casualty and outpatients departments. English Harbour is famous for its historic associations with Nelson, whose house is now preserved as a museum. The friends of English Harbour have restored the dockyard, and now it has become a favourite anchorage for yachts. St Kitts, beautiful and mountainous, the Queen was greeted by the administrator, Mr Phillips. At Warner Park, the Queen inspected units from the Defence Force, Cadet Corps, Police and Youth Organisations. Sugar is the mainstay of the island's economy. And at Basseterre, the Queen saw some of the processes used in milling the entire sugar crop of St Kitts and Nevis. Centuries ago, Brimstone Hill Fortress was known as the Gibraltar of the West Indies. It was fiercely defended by British and French in turn, but was severely damaged by a hurricane in 1834. The Queen was presented with a miniature cannon by the Society for the Restoration of Brimstone Hill. In the afternoon, the Queen visited the neighbouring island of Nevis and acknowledged a rousing welcome from the balcony of Government House. Terrace, the Queen and Prince Philip were shown plans for the future tourist industry in Nevis, including hotels, shops and swimming pools. It seemed as if all the 13,000 inhabitants of Nevis came down to the quay to wave goodbye to the Queen and to call, come again soon. Tortola, the largest of the British Virgin Islands, the Queen was greeted by the administrator, Mr. Staveley. Her first engagement was to open the West End Road, part of an extensive road and bridge program. 
The Queen then drove along the new road to a welcoming ceremony in Road Town, where she received a gift of a model of a traditional Virgin Island sloop. Livestock is an increasingly important part of the island's agricultural economy, and the improvement of animal health, stock breeding, and the extension of pasture are undertaken at the agricultural station, where the Queen was shown selected cattle and horses. The Queen marked another important event in the island's development when she opened the new Queen Elizabeth Bridge, linking Tortolo with the airstrip on Beef Island. This will have growing importance with the increase of the tourist industry in these lovely islands. A United States missile tracking station was established at Grand Turk in 1952. And ten years later, Major John Glenn was brought here after completing the first American manned space flight. The Queen and Prince Philip were shown models of rockets and space capsules as they toured the station. At a reception in the gardens of Government House, the royal couple talked informally with some of the guests. Fishing is an important occupation in the Turks and Caicos Islands, and at South Caicos, the Queen and Prince Philip watched the lobster catch being brought in and prepared for market. race provided one of the highlights of the stay in South Caicos. But you can never rely on a donkey, even on a royal occasion. The winner was Willie Boy, and the Queen and Prince Philip spent some time after the race talking to the competitors. The fleet of graceful Caicos sloops ended a memorable day when they saluted the royal guests as they returned to Britannia. The Bahamas, with their white coral sands, lagoons and brilliant sea colours, have long been known as a holiday paradise. At Nassau, the Governor Sir Ralph Grey, with Lady Grey and the Premier Sir Roland Simonette, welcomed the Queen and Prince Philip. The Bahamas police force formed a guard of honour. And then the Queen walked through a dense crowd of Bahamians and tourists on her way across Rawson Square. Outside the legislature, the Premier presented her with a gold galleon paperweight, a gift which had been on display several days before her visit. In Clifford Park, scouts and guides gave a display. There were gymnastics too, and police dogs showed their paces through the obstacle course. At the Princess Margaret Hospital, the Queen and Prince Philip visited a number of wards and took a keen interest in the welfare of the young patients in the children's ward. Early children's home, they sang two songs specially for the royal visitors. The home, which was opened in 1956, is for orphans and other children in need of care. And the Queen and Prince Philip spent some time talking to children and staff. No 
visitor to the Bahamas could miss riding in a Surrey. And just for one day, this Surrey became a royal coach as it drove the Queen to the Bahama Rama display. This exhibition was specially mounted so that the Queen and Prince Philip could see in a small space some aspects of Bahamian life, which they would not have time to see in reality during their short stay. From the beautiful Bahamas, Britannia sailed on to Jamaica, a country of industrial expansion and vigor, and the biggest producer of bauxite in the world. The Queen drove through the gaily decorated streets of Kingston to a resounding welcome. Troops of the 1st Battalion, the Jamaica Regiment, formed a guard of honor on the occasion of the state opening of Parliament. Members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives arrived, followed by the Governor General, Sir Clifford Campbell. The Queen received the royal salute before being escorted into the Council Chamber. She came to open Parliament as Queen of Jamaica, and to read from the throne the speech which declared the government's program for the next session. The speech, presented to the Queen by the Acting Prime Minister, Mr. Donald Sangster, outlined plans for economic expansion, for the improvement of health, housing and education. Speaking of the Commonwealth, the Queen said, My government in Jamaica has played a full part in maintaining the strength and unity of the Commonwealth. This has been done not only through active participation in the highest Commonwealth organ, the meeting of Commonwealth Prime Ministers, and through such organizations as the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and the meeting of Commonwealth Finance Ministers, but through the interchange of views which Jamaica daily has with its Commonwealth partners. Later, the Queen and Prince Philip paid a short visit to Prime Minister Sir Alexander Bustamante, who was prevented by ill health from taking an active part in the royal visit. On the last day of the tour, the Queen came ashore at Doctor's Cave Pier in Montego Bay. At a civic reception, Mr. Sangster said goodbye to the royal visitors on behalf of the Jamaican people and expressed the belief that the visit would further cement the bonds of friendship between Jamaica and Britain. In her reply, the Queen said, I hope very much that my presence among you has helped all Jamaicans to feel a greater sense of unity and brotherhood with that worldwide association of peoples which we call the Commonwealth. And she went on, we have traveled through many lands and territories of the Caribbean with their varied histories and their very distinct customs and characteristics, yet so alike in their loyalty and kindness. This has been a most moving experience for both of us. And to all my peoples in the Caribbean, I send my warmest good wishes for the future. 